All right, good afternoon. I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is John Kenyon. I'm the director of the City of Literature Organization. I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 Book Festival. We'd like to thank the sponsors who make the event possible. City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, Iowa City Public Library, Prairie Lights, of course, Iowa Public Radio, The Graduate Hotel, and Think Iowa City. Between events, we ask that you would visit the book fair that's going on at Merge, which is at 136 South Dubuque Street, just down the block here. And uh, there are many independent publishers that are down there and some other uh, literary organizations from our area that you could visit and find out more about what they're doing. Wanted to share that the vast majority of book festival events are free, but they do not come without cost. So if you have the ability to offer any support, we would certainly welcome it. You could look more into that at iowacitybookfestival.org, or we have very handily put on the back of your print programs a QR code that you could use to find that as well. So uh, any support that you would offer allows us to do events like this and others in the future. So today we will hear from poet Jennifer L. Knox. Jennifer is the author of six books of poems, and her poems have appeared in The New Yorker, American Poetry Review, Granta and Poetry, and five times in the Best American Poetry series. She's currently at work on Mykiowa, a traveling public art installation supported by the Iowa Arts Council and the NEA, and you could actually see some of those things around downtown today, and I'm sure Jennifer will talk more about that. She lives in central Iowa and is the proprietor of Salt Liquors, a small spice blend company. And today she will read from her most recent collection, Crushing It. So please help me welcome Jennifer. Thank you, John. And thanks everybody for coming out. Move this up so I stand up straight. <laughs> uh, because of this book came out October, probably the second week in October, 2020. Mm -hmm. So not only during uh, the, probably not the height of COVID fear that keeps going, but um, a, a little peak I'd say, and uh, right before the election. So people had so many things on their minds and I'm, that's why I'm especially grateful to uh, be here and to be able to share it. This is called Erwin Allen versus the Lion Tamer. And I wrote this poem. Uh, finally, at, for years, I've been trying to find a way to work in. Uh, if you're familiar with that movie, Fast, Cheap, and Out of Control, uh, the Lion Tamer in that movie. Uh, he says that he loved Clyde Beatty movies when he was a little kid because back then people didn't know who would win in a battle of man versus nature, but now we do. And uh, then there's a band called Killdozer and they have a song called Man Versus Nature that's about Irwin Allen, the, also known as the master of disaster films like The Towering Inferno and such. So this is Irwin Allen versus the Lion Tamer. We used to love Lion Tamers because people really didn't know who would win in a battle of man versus nature. Back then, all the stories ended in death, our death, by mauling or snake bite or dog bite or being struck by lightning, smothered by an avalanche, charged off a cliff, carried away in the talons of an eagle, inhaled by a whale, stung by a scorpion, swarmed by killer bees, gored by a rhino, poisoned by berries, pricked by a sticker, swallowed by quicksand, beguiled by a black cat, gobbled up by a witch. So imagine the relief with one flick of the whip and an up, the skulking lion stands on legs like a human. After all those years of fear, I'd laugh at it too. And that's what people did until there were no more lions to laugh at. But Erwin Allen knew death doesn't live in a thing you could kill with a gun. It's not the heat, it's the hubris. The fire that wipes the city out begins in birthday candles and the happy huff behind them. The storm that flips the cruise ship 
starts in the sea that rises up to fill the empty sky. An airplane crash begins not in birds, but in the feeders we've stolen the seed from, certain nobody can see us. That's a cheery one. <laughs> and uh, this one's called Wolverine Season. There's a lot of dialogue in this book. And reading from it sometimes feels like I'm giving a puppet show. <laughs> so there's some dialogue in this poem. Wolverine Season. Oh, honey, are you OK? I asked the woman in the bathroom soaking wet as if she'd just emerged from the shower. Yeah, maybe too much rum on an empty stomach. She wiped her mouth with her hand and left. In the sink, waxy red flecks of lipstick. That woman over there just puked up lipstick in the bathroom, I yelled in my friend's ear over the Black Sabbath tribute band. <laughs> Write a poem about that, she yells back and smiles. We were up late for a school night. It was all part of the new regimen. The documentary I'd just seen about death said rocking out is actually good for you. And rocking out to Sabbath, dude, we were gonna live like forever on the bones other animals passed up. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Speaking of death, uh, this is this is a poem about my all my ladies in metropolis illinois and they talk like this so the puppet show here contains some drawing and uh, it's called old women talking about death when did i become one of them i used to roll my eyes at their gory stories EMTs found a neighbor at the bottom of her basement steps, a head to toe hematoma. Use a cane, I told her, shrugs. Grandma and the great aunts itemized her injuries. Poor dear, how long till she was found? They told their stories picnicking atop our people at the cemetery, atop all the men in our family who died young. The rest disappeared. Shrug, so no stories for them. These days, when I call Kay, she tells me about her friends who were dying or have died since we last spoke. And I feel closer to her, an adult. Yesterday, Jay filled me in on M's cancer. It's bad, she whispered. I leaned forward. M's doctors removed her necrotic uterus through her abdomen and two jammy black hunks because her insides had decayed into a sarcomatous tar pit. Then her incision dehissed. I cocked my head. She made a starburst motion over her belly button. Ah, I've heard that happens with cancer, I said, grateful that Z had described the process to me after her stepmother had died. Now I even have a name for that indignity. Thank God. I hate surprises. <laughs> this is a poem for my mother. The gift. You can tell whether a bird has a mate if there are pin feathers on its head. New feathers that start out as stubs full of blood, then enshroud themselves in a white scaly coat as they grow. Preening releases the feather but a bird can't reach the top of its own head. A mate preens that spot, unless the bird is alone in a cage. Pin feathers itch, so I preen my unpaired birds, wrap them in a towel, scritch their heads, and blow till the dandruffy stuff flutters out. They look pretty mangy this morning, I recall, as I stare at the side of my mother's face from the back seat. How long has it been since I took her in for a haircut? and her whiskers, she can't see to shave. We're driving back roads, pointing out deer and hawks as she ahs before taking her back to her apartment. Colin calls it traveling gravel. 
She loves it when he drives and I sit in the back so she could talk as much as she wants. He always answers her questions. Sometimes I'll go hours without saying a word while she talks and talks. When I was little, she'd bring a book to restaurants and read while I, no doubt, talked and talked. Things children said weren't interesting to her, she told me, and family never had to say, I'm sorry. Yes, we've hurt each other, but only I've done it on purpose. Did I tell you she bought me this car? It's the most generous gift I've ever received. When uh, that poem came out in, I think it was Best American Poetry, I said, what do you think, Mom? She said, well, you sure really can't do that thing with the stuff. <laughs> Which I think is good. Uh, this, this is called The Day After the Fair. I wrote this after speaking with uh, an Iowa DNR agent who was telling me about chronic wasting disease and how it sits in, well, I don't know if it sits in the deer or what the deer eats, but then all of a sudden it turns itself on and it could be 20 years, kind of like mad cow. The day after the fair, the day after the fair, a drone discovered the sea of dead but the people back at HQ piloting the drone were dead too. Their bodies crumpled on a deep blue carpet. So the drone flew till its battery ran out and plummeted into the endless undulating hills of dead people. Pork chops on a stick, garbage. Some protein had come gunning for us and the spin out flung it everywhere, efficient. It happened slowly over millions of years it happened in an instant. The mushroom spores blown in to break down the plastic and people made it to the soundboard, tripped the loudspeakers and flooded the dead world with the band singing When I Paint My Masterpiece, which the mushrooms love to sing and they learned to sing it just like Levon. The spores memorized all the songs and books and pictures. They thought these were lists of things we wanted bad but never got. Any Levon fans out there? <laughs> All right. Mm, yeah. uh, oh, that's just too weird. Never. Never? Well, oh, maybe. This is for my aunt Marilyn. It's called Marilyn, every day we wonder. <laughs> Marilyn, every day we wonder what you think about all this. I imagine you crashing through the inaugural barricades or flying a stolen helicopter into a wildfire with a margarita gripped between your knees. Remember gridlocked on the five, you winked at a bearded dude leaning on an asphalt roller I'd only seen women wink at men in movies. He leered, I might get laid. <laughs> and you drawled, why don't you get that piece of shit out of the road? <laughs> Shock splashed across his face. Lock the doors. <laughs> Crazy bitch, he roared and punched our hood. Clueless how close he was to getting his ass shot. We found the loaded gun under your mattress, Smith and Wesson, cowgirl style, swirly pearl handle, and the serial number filed off. <laughs> We'd like to take it out at parties. What a cute gun. We also found several transistor radios and a box of old weed. Cheers, Auntie. With one phone call, you scared my scary Brooklyn landlord into fixing my deadbolt. You were six states away and a 72-year-old woman. <laughs> There's a pack of kids down the street in a house that's falling apart. We never see an adult. No matter how cold or dark it is, they're always playing outside with a new puppy. We have no idea where the old puppies have gone. But if you were here, we know there'd be no more of this new puppy bullshit. <laughs> 
And that is very true. I, I'm going to read. Um, I'm going to read one more out of this book, and then I'm going to read some new stuff. Which, if you're not crazy about this, wait till you hear the new stuff. <laughs> this is called Pretty. Wait, can I read this? Is the children's section? Okay. <laughs> Just making sure. Pretty. A head taller, but a year younger than my girlfriends with their bouncy boobs and full blown rose bushes. They knew how to squeeze into tight white zip around jeans without getting their pubes snagged in the metal teeth, clenched from tag to belly button. You couldn't wear underwear with those things. My tight white jeans were too short and gave me a camel toe. My clit popped like a knuckle against the, against the seam. In skates, I was even taller, hunched, mouth agape or talking shit, squinting, always this close to falling, flailing, arms out, neck deep in an incoming tide. I couldn't skate sideways or backwards or even fast. So when the lights dimmed and the disco ball lit up and the boy on black skates, the slick kind you couldn't buy at the rink, with red toe stops rolled up and held out his hand to me. I, he's asking you to skate, my girlfriend said. Dumb, duh, dumbass, hot another hard as she pushed me from behind. I took his hand and he gently, in a way that showed he knew I couldn't skate, led me into the current. Nobody gets too much heaven by the Bee Gees. I looked down at my flabby little tits, all nipple. Not at the boy with blonde hair I'd seen at the rink before, skating for hours, backwards, jumps, but always alone. I felt sorry for him until I looked up and realized he was much older than me and all the kids around us. The song ended. He asked me to skate again, and I said, no, I'm tired, but thought, you must think I'm pretty fucking stupid. <laughs> Which is exactly the same thing I think now, whenever a stranger holds his hand out to me. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to read uh, two new poems about uh, menopause. Yay! But they're, um, they're about being alive, not being dead. This uh, title currently is Upcycled Driftwood Art. That's not, gonna, that's not gonna make it. Driving home from the punk rock show, which was right here in Iowa City. Driving home from the punk rock show, a 73-year-old French sexpert on the radio discusses menopause and vaginal lubrication. She's taught thousands of women how to masturbate, even her own mother. At 55, sex became very painful for me. I worried that I would never enjoy sex again, but then I discovered anal sex, and oh, it was fantastic, like a new planet, but my husband, he was 67 and I, he did not like anal sex, so we divorced. And I met a 23 years old man, a very handsome man, a chef who loves anal sex and he is very good at it. As a teenager, I went to tons of punk rock shows in moldy bowling alleys and YMCA basements, some just out in the middle of the desert. Ugh. Now I know I hated all of them. Every vomity mosh pit, every punch in the throat. No one could hear me talking over the music and I had lots of interesting things to say. <laughs> but the punk rock show tonight was phenomenal. The youngest guy in the band was 59. One song went, I'm so nervous, I'm so nervous, over and over and I was like, me too. <laughs> With drums, I'm usually like, get away from me. But this one was, gooey and muscled and mumpy. 
Maybe it's because there's so much less water sloshing around in my body now, dragging me in and out like the tide. True story. And this is this is a good one. You sat you sat through all the all the death. This is a good one. Uh, working title is Secret Santa. That's not gonna make it. And this is all true. The DSM five describes episodes of hyperfamiliarity for unknown faces or huff huff as disturbing and abnormal. But I want to hug all the people I feel like I know in this grocery store, which is everyone. <laughs> the most common cause of huff huff is a brain tumor. The second, menopause. My brains struck a deep vein of rainbow dopamine that's enabling me to visualize the interconnectedness of all humans. Kind of like Jimmy Stewart and Harvey, but if you read the play, you find out he was just drunk. No person is one thing. A self is a clump of crossed biochemical physical wiring. Wrap those clumps in electrical tape, color coded by experience, especially hallucinogens. But I've never blown a dome of unconditional love over a whole supermarket full of people and the adjacent parking lot on acid. And my menopausal brain promises it won't buck me off. And I trust it which may be the first time I've ever trusted my brain. Siri, take a note. Hafaf's not a family feeling. Family equals what is and isn't outside. My hafaf has no inside and outside, no obligation, shame, or fear. My hafaf says, I know you, I love you. That's all I can do. If other people had hafaf, all the songs on the radio and bumper stickers and embroidery kits at Hobby Lobby would say, I know you, I love you, that's all I can do. There'd be drugs that doubled, even tripled the huff huff, and all kinds of strangers would be hugging on you. The military would develop ear lasers that burn huff huff out of people's brains, leaving empty smoldering holes in its place. I don't know you, I don't love you, I could do more, but I won't. Siri, take a note. I can tell by other shoppers' smiles that the love emanating from me feels good to them, not creepy. That's new. I smile at the grown-ass man flinging frozen pizzas into his grandma's shopping cart, and it makes him feel good. Normally, I'd have already beheaded this yo-yo with a samurai sword in my mind, but today it feels like I'm his former kindergarten teacher. Trevor, well look at you, all grown up, and you must be Nana. Why, it feels like I'm every shopper's former kindergarten teacher, even Nana's. Six months later, the huff's gone. I don't know when it flew off or how to feel now. Those were my spectacular feelings, but for some reason I'm worried about all the other people. Huff Huff never let me worry. Worry was always way up there, like where the RVs park overnight. I was gonna say, and nobody I know owns an RV, but that's not true. I just don't know who they are yet. <laughs> Thank you. I, I should stay here. You can. Okay, yeah. I'll stay here. So we have uh, time for questions. Yeah, we've got about time. So if anyone has a question they would like to ask, you can let me know. Yeah. So I'm curious how you decided to write poetry and do you write any other genres? Um, that's a great question. Uh, Trying to think back. I've told this story before, but it, the memory is like, well, oh, why did I end up doing this? Um, so I had tried theater, visual art, uh, music, and pretty much every other thing that you could take in high school or college, and uh, it just didn't work. But when I found poetry, I found it through SLAM. So, 
And it was great because I didn't have to sit there through all those rehearsals for a play and I could write my own thing, but it only had to be this big Yahtzee. <laughs> and then uh, after I did slam for a few years, I thought, well, I want to go and study this, which I did right here as an undergraduate. I was in the undergraduate workshop and my first um, teacher was Gerald Stern, which Yahtzee. Um, <laughs> at one point, and he loves this story. He got up on top of the table and wrote stupid students on the chalkboard. Uh, it was funny. It, it might not sound funny, but uh, it was very, very funny. And uh, when I saw that what you could do on the page was so vast, that's what hooked me in. And I also think I was diagnosed with ADHD in my early 50s. I think uh, to sustain the longer form, can't do it. Maybe, maybe I'll be able to one day if I, you know, if part of the lobe goes or something like that. But or if I'm always sedated. <laughs> but it's it's uh, been very welcoming. That and I mean, you know, you could do whatever you want in that room. It's terrific. Does anybody else have questions? Oh, yeah. Let me. Um, okay. So hold on. Let me bring the microphone to you. So when you write, um, as you write, do you read it aloud too? Because they're so great. Is that part of your process? No, I don't. Yeah, and. Uh, Hearing me read them, I didn't know this, but uh, people have told me that there is a big difference between the work on the page and hearing me read it. So maybe it would be a good idea for me to do that. <laughs> maybe that's a, a new strategy for revision in 2022. I, I really just think like, uh, oh, what's Jenga? Well, I was curious, you know, you had that one poem, I guess it was the first one you read where you said, and then she said, oh, write a poem about this. Mm -hmm. Do you get that from people a lot who know you're a writer, know you're a poet, who think, oh, mm -hmm. you should write about this, what about this idea? Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you normally respond to that? Uh, if it's good, very well. I take it and I run with it. And I say, thank you. Good one. Let's do that again sometime. Uh, the, I'm going to name drop the poet Ada Lamone, who is now the poet laureate of the United States. Um, here's some, here's the one she gave me. Uh, oh, she gave me pretty. And she changed the last two lines. I had, I, I ended it with like, she's like, no, 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 let's move that up and let's, let's end up, let's have a softer ending in there. I was like, oh, all right. That's why she's the poet laureate. Um, the how to manage your adult ADHD. She gave me that idea. Um, she named the book Crushing It. Yeah, I was right in the middle of the story. Uh, mm. Like I thought I was crushing it, but then, oh, oh, it was when I was getting my ADHD test. I thought I was doing really good with the test. And I'm like, man, I am crushing it. And then I look up at the guy's face. I'm like, Ooh, not crushing it. And while I'm telling her this, she says, that's the name of your new book. I'm like, oh, crushing it? Okay. Uh, yeah, I could go through the, go through the whole, go through the whole book and, uh, find attributions to various various people. I usually start in something that is misheard, uh, something wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a question over here. Let me bring the mic. So it, yeah, it was really interesting to uh, to hear that you came out of slam poetry early on, you mm -hmm. know, because I mean, the 
the humor in your poems, uh, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the sort of the, the boldness, the weirdness, mm -hmm. um, and, and all the voices that yeah. are there, which, which I, you know, I mean, I can see those on the page too. Mm -hmm. I mean, they work on the page too. I mean, I think how, probably better. Yeah. Yeah. I, how much do you think that came out of that early experience of, you know, of working in that particular genre? Uh, how much of it is just you being you? Mm. Um, well, probably it's a chicken or the egg on slam that I found myself there because I liked to talk at people, not with, at. <laughs> And I loved, uh, I loved theater, I loved using different voices, but I didn't have the attention staying power for something like that. And in a poem, boy, you can write like every letter, you can change it up if you're working at that microscopic level. Uh, so I think it was knowing that I could do that. I, I don't think people who, who didn't start in slam know that that that's an that's an arm in the costume i don't think they know that's there also i've worked for a long time in advertising so getting people to read to the bottom of the page was always the goal in marketing copy and weird stuff drives people forward if you start the poem with something really weird they're gonna you got them they're gonna finish it unless it's so gross they don't and i've done that too i <laughs> made that mistake and any other questions from folks um one thing i wanted to ask so in your poem that you read about the punk rock show and coming to iowa yes. city as you mentioned but no one would necessarily know reading the poem that it was in iowa city i was wondering what the the fact that you're an iowa writer what influence does that have, if any, on your poetry? Or do you feel that sense of place and does it seep into your poems? It does. Uh, this book, Crushing It, was is the first book I've written entirely, that was written entirely in Iowa. And the influences that I can directly put my fingers on um, is people, there's a lot more people and fewer distractions. Um, because before I was living in New York, so it was like, uh, and sustain that I'm no longer compelled to move forward to the next image or the next uh, speaker so quickly. So if you think I jump around in this one, if you look back they're even jumpier uh and i think iowans are very funny in a in a sardonic way and th that's definitely more in this book um a a comfort with this the cycles of life and nature i think that's in the book too Maybe this is a good time to segue to the Mike Iowa project. Mm, yes. Uh, something else to talk about beyond the poetry. Maybe explain a little bit more about that. So when you leave the shop today, out, out on the street, there is a little sign you'll see that's part of a project my husband and I put together that is funded by the NEA and the Iowa Arts Council called Mike Iowa. It's some signs that we put up because we want people to know about microremediation, which cleans up uh, heavy metals, um, farm chemicals. It could clean it in water and land. And what I, I teach at uh, Iowa State University and I'm, I boggle, my mind boggles when I think about the the environmental overload that my students are going to have to deal with. I, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have the tail end of it. Uh, so knowing that microremediation can fix things is blew my mind. 
So that's what those signs are doing out there today. Just letting people know this is a thing that exists. And if you scan the QR code, you go to the website and you can see some really great uh, videos of microremediation. Trad Cotter, who is a microremediation expert, he used to be a commercial mushroom farmer, uh, will show you how to get rid of a pair of jeans with mycelium that you could buy on Etsy. I, I don't recommend that. I do not recommend <laughs> buying mycelium on Etsy, uh, but you can. So that it, it was very, it took a huge burden off of my mind knowing, oh, this will work. We might not use it, but it exists. They used it, uh, a lot of companies used it to clean up after the California wildfires. It's, uh, it's a game changer. So that's why the signs are out there. So mushrooms. After we're done, the mushrooms will, will take over. Oh yeah, you betcha. And they, they love listening to the band. <laughs> they love Levon. Did uh, you consider, or do you think you might write about that sort of thing in your poetry? Is, you know, this is a separate project for you, but mm. you think about addressing that in that way? Um, mushrooms creep into, into a lot of the poems in this book and a lot of the poems in my previous book. If I sit down to write about something, I'm dead in the water. So, uh, one thing I, I, uh, you asked, uh, how is this book different? I feel like I am much more tapped into how that we were just talking about Quakers and how that community connects people in a sustaining way, like the mycorrhizal base under the soil collects the mushrooms that come up and connects the trees to each other and to sugar and uh, brings nutrients to the ecology and people too, that if we don't have, I mean, that's what Sorry, that's what MAGA's standing in for that. They're like, oh, that's a that's a sustaining base right there. No, it's poison. But um, I forgot what I was, forgot where I was going with that. Mushrooms, yeah, um, they're awesome. Do we have any other questions from anyone here? Oh, hold on there. So, uh, so is there any kind of partnership going on between Mike Iowa and like the um, the College of Agriculture at uh, at Iowa State? No, but um, I have a I uh, am talking to somebody at the Des Moines Waterworks because they are very interested in cleaning up the uh, Des Moines Waterway, and this would be perfect. And it's cheap and it's fast. You could do it on land and in water. Mm -hmm. Good so news. Getting back to the, the poetry for a moment. So the, the new book is on Copper Canyon, which yes. is obviously one of the most esteemed poetry presses in the country. I mean, that's no pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Has that made a difference in terms of anything related to promotion or people awareness or how you've approached this? I have seen, whoa, my blood pressure just, um, so yes, uh, there's a, yeah. Ooh, I thought I was gonna faint there for a minute. So yes, <laughs> the, the body is telling me that it's important. Uh, I know that it, it has, um, that people who have been reading my books for a long time, they've approached this book in a different way. Like, hmm, oh, this is the fancy book. Oh, okay. Like, no, what's he still in it? It's okay. <laughs> like, hmm, I don't know about that. Wait, we'll see. <laughs> Was not where I expected you to go with that, but I, I should have, I suppose, by now. Sorry. So that's all right. Sorry. All right. And so, obviously, writing new poems. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this has been such a weird time, you know, such for this book time. to come out 
during the kind of ramp up of a pandemic that we didn't know would still be going on yep. today. But does that inform what you're doing? And, Absolutely. And just in terms of output, subject, any of those things. Mm -hmm. um, the sort of fuck it, panic, fuck it, panic, fuck it, panic that com propelled my life for so long before the pandemic is no longer op operating. So I can't, I'm not building to the point that I used to build to. I'm, my crescendos are not the same. My diminuendos are not the same. Uh, and that's why I said, when I pulled out those new poems, ah, that title's not gonna last. It's, uh, and I, I heard Louise Gluck speak and she said that there were many times when she went three years without writing and she said, I'm never going to write again. And she had to construct um, little hurdles that made her think and move in a different way through her work. So that's what I'm doing. And definitely the, the breath is longer. Well, your new book is crushing it, and yes. we're so glad that you could come and join us. Thank you for having me, John. Yes, thank you, and please help me to thank Jennifer for being with us. Thanks for coming.